So this is where we get into the study of what we scientists call the biofield and why I'm so excited about this, because the biofield is teaching us how deeply interconnected we are, right? That I don't end at my skin, that my energy can actually foster healing in another person or people. And so scientifically, here's the definition, because we like to use all these big words. Biofields are interacting and interpenetrating fields of energy and information that regulate the homeodynamic functioning of a living organism. So let's break that down. Basically, there are fields of energy and information, some are electromagnetic, some are not, that connect us and heal us. Okay, that's the point. So this isn't actually so strange. We know about things like EKGs and EGs. We're measuring the electromagnetic readouts of our organ systems on the skin, and that tells us about our heart and brain health. So we know about that. We even study the magnetic fields off of the brain using magnetic encephalograms, and there we actually have the electrodes off of the body, and we measure magnetic fluctuations, and those tell us about the state of our brain health. Pretty mainstream. Some of the other really cool mainstream work, when we talk about the biofield, we can talk about measuring and working with the biofield of cells and of people, and even the biofields of the earth. And we'll get into in the second part of this, how we connect our biofields with each other and with the earth for powerful healing. But I wanna share with you that we are learning that we can actually work with the biofield of cells to grow new tissue, even in the brain. So biofield science is having an impact on regenerative medicine. This is Michael Levin at Tufts University, doing fantastic work in this area. And it's kind of the more mainstream bioelectromagnetic aspect of biofield science. But then we have prana, qi, qigong, pranic healing, jiu rei, external, external qigong he, healing, laying on of hands, um, therapeutic touch, healing touch, right? All of these modern practices and the ancient ones too that would work with understanding and feeling and potentially for some even seeing the field and working with those subtle energies to foster healing. And here's the thing, what I've learned is it doesn't matter what the type of practice is. Some people see the field and they really see it and they see it as a unified field. Some see it as multi-layered. Some have protocols and practices for particular ailments and some don't. But they all say, when I ask them, what, what are you doing? They'll say, Shamini, I don't even like the term healer because I'm not the healer. I'm just a healing facilitator. The person I'm working with is doing their own healing, and I'm just facilitating those conditions by opening myself to the larger energy. Some will call it universal life energy, consciousness, God, spirituality, nature, prana. There's so many ways that they describe this. And they'll say, I'm just being an open vessel. The energy isn't coming from me. It's coming through me, and I'm helping facilitate this healing. That's pretty much what all of them say. So I call it channeling the currents of compassion because they have to actually get into a grounded, non-egoic, receptive state, right? And I'm interested in this as a scientist as well as a practitioner because I know that there are patients out there, for example, the ones that I've studied with chronic debilitating levels of fatigue from cancer. That's a randomized control trial that I, I did and published in cancer. Um, PTSD, chronic pain, that are really wiped out. So they could try to do meditation or even exercise and things like that, but they literally don't have the energy. And so these types of practices can really help them restore their energy to where they can engage in things that they can do on their own as well. It's not an either or. So what do we see? I detail a lot of the science in my book and I take you on the journey of the placebo controlled trial so you can understand that this is beyond placebo. But I'm just gonna summarize for you here that we see strong evidence for pain and for anxiety, for hospitalized patients and for dementia. And we also see a lot of reduction in symptoms and even impacts in physiology, including shifts in cortisol rhythms and maintenance of immune function for cancer patients. That's all published data that I review in my book. And we also see that touch isn't the only factor here because we have systematic reviews that are looking at this with biofield therapies where touch isn't involved in all. And in the book, I go over distant healing, I go over all the data for that. There's a lot of data. 
I want to just point out a couple of more pieces of data because people say, well, if this is really real, then it should get under the skin. And our, our society is so materialist that we have to basically, we won't believe it's true in science and medicine unless we see some effects on physiology. So there are some incredible studies that are coming out there and have come out looking at these effects of biofield energy, subtle energy, on cells and in animals. And here's some wonderful work that's been done by Gloria Gronowicz. The reason we say biofield and not just energy is because we do, first of all, see effects at a distance. And the way we define energy is that it drops off at a distance. It follows an inverse square law. So if it was just energy in the way that we define it, then we wouldn't be able to explain these distant effects. The other reason is because biofield opens up for us to talk about these are carrier waves of information. And one of the things we're learning from these cell studies is that the biofield has intelligence because Gloria and others have found that you can actually do healing work with these cells under carefully controlled compared to sham conditions, you know, using tried and true methods that you would use to look at drugs or other types of therapeutics. And you find that the energy will actually increase cell proliferation or the number of cells if they're healthy, but it will actually decrease them if they're cancerous. How does that happen? Like we honestly, we have no idea from science that it's, you know, we know that it's happening. We have no idea there's an intelligence that's being carried by this energy. So some of the most fascinating work that has just been published by my colleagues at MD Anderson University or MD Anderson Cancer Center comes from my dear friend and colleague, Lorenzo Cohen, who runs the Integrative Health Research Center there. He's been there for decades, very well NIH funded researcher for things like Tibetan yoga and acupuncture and other things for cancer patients. He's just published two studies and they're more really exciting studies that are going to come out from that lab where they're looking at this in mouse models of cancer. And what they have found in two studies so far is that emitted bioenergy can actually reduce tumors in mouse models of cancer all the way down to cytokine levels, which are immune transmitters, uh, inflammatory cytokines decrease, cell subsets associated with tumor shrinkage are altered, and even protein signaling pathways, certain protein kinases are, are altered. I go over all of this and the correspondences of this data with other data from Harvard and other places. We're seeing a pattern here. Okay, so, you know, really that's the point. I just want you to know how real this data is. And in science, one study is not enough. Honestly, for things like this that are as groundbreaking as they are, we need hundreds of studies. And I will share with you kind of the plight because it is real and it's not a whine. The reason we started the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, our nonprofit, was to support these scientists. And as I share in my book, in my journey of going through this, and I share some personal journeys of my experiences with these healing therapies and how I've come to realize that the path of healing and the path of spiritual liberation are one and the same. That's my personal journey, and maybe you've had that as well. There's a story for these scientists, too, that it's very hard to get funding support for this work. NIH and other organizations aren't funding it. And they don't have a lot of community, these scientists. And there are a lot of, there's a lot of pushback. I mean, I won't name who, but several of my colleagues, even with this incredibly published, you know, groundbreaking data that should be in top scientific journals, have chief scientific officers trying to stop their research because it's just so weird, right? And so, you know, the question is, what are we really afraid of? You know, can we, it all goes back to our cosmology. And this comes back to our personal practice and our personal understanding. Because when we as a humanity move from this sort of fear-based rhetoric that we have been fed for so long, that we are separate, that we're not that powerful, that we can't heal ourselves really well, or it's not real, or it's a small effect, and it's not important, and we can't heal others, you know, we have to rely on things outside of ourselves. That's just outdated. I want you to know that the science is telling you that that's outdated. It's 20th century thinking, y'all. <laughs> we're in the 21st century now. So we're going to have to move beyond that. And, you know, for each of you that have the privilege to have conversations, whether it's with your doctors or health administrators or other folks, I want you to share with them that the science is really real. 